morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, please open your hymnals as we stand and sing our call to worship, number 237. I stand amazed in the presence, number 237. so good to see you here this morning as we gather to worship the Lord and just a joy to, to see you and have you here to worship. Uh, you remember back last year uh, during Vacation Bible School, we had a, a small group of children, but we had Gail and Ronnie here who shared about their ministry in Cape Town and we took up an offering for them and that offering went church-wide and we took up over almost $2,300, I think that went directly to them through the International Mission Board. Well, she sent an email today, or Wednesday, I received an email from her giving us what they've done with that money. And if you ever think, if you just let this be an example, if we ever think our small little efforts in Deering, Georgia, do not touch people with the gospel uh, around the world, then we're mistaken. So listen, listen to what Gail <coughs> said. Hello, church family. Yesterday was amazing. I reminded each of the Bible study attendees to be on time at our venue. All but one said they would be there. I did not tell them that I would be giving them food. When each refugee arrived, I explained about how your church, during Baptist, gave me money to buy food for them. They were very happy and thanked God for you and asked his blessings on you. 
They also wanted me to thank you for them. This is in itself as exciting. What happens besides that is even more exciting. As of Monday night, 27 people were attending Bible study weekly. Remember, this group of people has only met four times. Yesterday, four of the refugees brought friends to the Bible study expecting to be taught, not expecting to receive food. These new attendees had heard about God, that God heard about what God has been teaching the other refugees through the Gospel of Mark and wanted to learn too. <coughs> I had never met these four refugees before yesterday. 20 of the 31 refugees in the Bible study were new to me. I never before met them. Added to this, a past, a past English student who is a refugee from the Dominican Republic of the Congo heard I am teaching a Bible study and determined to find me. He met me in the parking lot after all the food was distributed. We had a great reunion. There are now 32 refugees attending the Bible study, and yesterday you fed, you fed them all enough food to last one to two weeks, depending on the size of their family. I had purchased enough food for the original 27 attendees. Then, then I thought I should buy more food, a bit more food, just in case new people came to the study that day, because new people had joined the study each week we'd met. New people did come to the study, and I had enough food to feed each of them the same amount as the original 27. Isn't God amazing? I was excited when God told me to teach the Bible to refugees and showed me a place that works perfectly for them. I could not even fathom the number of people he would bring to the study. I'd never taught the Bible to 32 people at one time. I did not know I, I know I did not cause 32 people to attend. Only God can do that. Thank you for being a part of this new ministry. Thank you for feeding these refugees. All totaled, you, Deering Baptist, are feeding about 160 people for one to two weeks. Keep allowing God to lead you to minister. Always seek his will, growing closer to God to be more like him. He wants to work through you, well done, Deering Baptist Church. So as I agree with her, well done, Deering Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Father, as I read this, I'm reminded of when our Lord had five loaves and two little fishes, and he fed the multitudes. And Father, we had a small attendance in Bible school but instead of allowing Satan to discourage us, you have overwhelmed us the results of last year's Bible school. How you took a few ch a little change that Bible school students brought. And then on top of that, the church wanted to be a part of this ministry. And we sent money. And that money has now been used to feed families in South Africa who at the same time, they're not just getting food, they're hearing the gospel. Lord, we praise your name. We give glory to you. And we praise you for how you used us, the little Baptist church in Deering, Georgia, to be instrumental in feeding people in Cape Town, South Africa, and instrumental in them hearing the gospel. Father, we give you alone praise and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stay seated and turn to page 161. In 161, Savior like a shepherd feed us.
Jesus, will you come join me, please? today. I have a picture for you. What's this lady doing right here? You can read that word. <laughs> it says, this lady's name is Hannah. And what is she doing? What is it like? Praying, isn't she? Yes. Hannah loved the Lord. And she loved to go to church. But there was one thing that made her sad. She didn't have any sons or daughters. So one time when she went to church, she was so sad that she didn't eat. But she went to the, the tabernacle and she there she began to pray. And this person over here is the priest or the preacher, Eli. And he watched her and he watched her and he saw how sad she was. So he asked her, he said, what's going on? And she told him, she said, I just asked the Lord to give me a son. I want a child so bad. And then he said something very remarkable. He said, may God give you what you prayed for. And Hannah left believing that God had heard her and that one day she would have a son. And guess what? A year later, she had a little boy and she named him Samuel. Yes, she did. She named him Samuel. So God does hear prayers and answer them. And I'm glad that we can pray anytime, not just at church, but we can pray at home. We can even pray at school. And you know what else? We can pray when we're praying. Yes, I'm happy about that. Would you join me right now and let's pray? Father God, we thank you so very much for this story about Hannah. A lady who loved you, and she prayed and prayed, and you answered her prayer. Father, help us not to just get discouraged when we pray, and we don't hear an answer. But help us to continue to lift up our voices to you, making our request made, not made known to you. So, Father, I ask you to bless these boys and their parents, and bless our church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today.
invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and I believe even on your outline, the scripture is accurate this week as compared to last week. But we're all on the same page today on everything. Luke chapter 22, verses, you know, I can look over those things and look over them and think everything's right, and then seldom is everything right. So, um, But anyway, Luke chapter 22, we'll be, we'll be reading in just a few moments, beginning in verse 39. We're continuing on our journey with Jesus to, to Easter and beyond. Today we come to the Garden of Gethsemane. So after finishing the, the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus, he left the upper room and led the disciples to the Mount of Olives where they've been spending the last few nights. As Jesus entered the garden, it was the end of a long and difficult day. And it was at the end of a long and difficult week that was about to become more difficult. Luke, in his usual abbreviated style of writing, he describes for us what occurs in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he doesn't mention some things that the other gospel writers mention. He, he does not mention the eight disciples who were left at the entrance of the garden. Matthew mentions that. Nor does he mention that three of the disciples, John, James, and Peter, who accompanied Jesus further into the garden. Matthew also shares that with us. Luke also does not tell us that on three separate times during the garden, while he was in the garden, on three separate times during the evening, that Jesus comes and finds his disciples sleeping. On the other hand, Luke does tell us a, a couple of things that the other gospel writers do not tell us. Luke tells us that Jesus' sweat became like great drops of blood as he prayed. And, and only Luke tells us that Jesus told his disciples to pray so that they would not enter into temptation. So with that kind of putting together some, some of the Gospels to, to, to add, to, to fill in some blanks, so to speak, let's look in our Bibles at Luke chapter 22 and we'll begin reading with verse 39. And he came, he, that is Jesus, came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said, said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in, a, in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now for a moment, I want us to focus on what Jesus was experiencing there in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark chapter 14, verse 33, we see where Jesus, as Mark says, Jesus began to, to be greatly distressed and troubled. In Mark chapter 14, verse 44, Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. And then in Luke 22, verse 44, that we just read, we read where, in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We look at these verses of Scripture, and we can only conclude one thing. Jesus was in deep spiritual and mental agony. So what was the cause of this agony. Some might would say, well, the cause of the agony was Jesus knew that the cross was coming. 
and that he was going to suffer a terrible death and excruciating pain on the cross. And that's probably part of it. But I believe that the cause of Jesus' agony was our sin and the price he was going to pay for our sin. The, the fact that he was going to become sin for us, I believe was the major reason for the cause of his agony. Think of it this way. The depth of Jesus' agony should give us some idea of Jesus' love for us and return our debt to him. The depth of his agony should give us some idea of his love for us and the debt we owe to him. Now that we've seen the agony and the suffering Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane, let's look at how he dealt with it. As we look at this passage of scripture, I want us to focus on how Jesus dealt with this agony, this suffering. And therefore, it, it helps us. He models for us how we can deal with our times of agony and suffering. Because all of us have experienced times of agony and suffering. We're experiencing a time of agony of suffering now, or we will sometime in the future. It's part of the human condition, is it not? But first of all, notice this, the first point. Jesus did not suffer alone. He did not suffer alone. In verse 39, we see where Jesus took all of the disciples with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And from Matthew's Gospel, we can see that when he went further into the Garden, where he would experience this spiritual and mental and emotional agony, he took his inner circle of disciples, those three that are, we know as Peter, James, and John, he took them further in there with him. Matthew 26, verse 37 says, And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He took his disciples with him. In this, in this time of greatest spiritual, mental, and emotional agony, he took those closest to him with him. <clears throat> How do we handle times like that? How often do we, when life really gets tough, how often do we isolate ourselves from other people, even those closest to us? How often do we just shut down and close up and just don't want to talk about it? As if that helps. That's certainly not the example we see in Jesus. And what we can take from this this one experience right here is if Jesus did not go at it alone by himself. And if Jesus knew he needed others around him in his time of agony, how much more is this true for you and for me? Jesus knew what he was about to face. He knew the agony and the physical pain, but he knew the spiritual and emotional pain he was about to experience on that cross. And he took the three people who were closest to pray with him. That's what we need when life gets hard, isn't it? When life gets hard, we need other Christians the most. We don't need to, we don't need to be alone by ourselves as much as we need other Christians. Now, there's times to be alone. <clears throat> but we can isolate ourselves and not let anyone know what we're going through and we suffer alone. But when life gets hard, that's when we need Christians the most. When we're struggling, when we're suffering, when we're hurting, the Lord will work through others to strengthen and encourage us. He didn't suffer alone. Second of all, Jesus did not suffer in silence. He didn't suffer in silence. Now, our faith should, should never be guided strictly by our emotions. We need to understand that. Our faith should never be strictly guided by our emotions. 
but our emotions are given to us by God. So there are times when our emotions must be expressed. After all, there's something healthy. If, 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 we're, if we're suffering in some way and we're struggling with something in some way, there's something spiritually and emotionally and mentally healthy about just a good cry. Just letting the tears flow, there's something healthy about that. <clears throat> And when we hold that in, there's something unhealthy about that. Jesus was not guided by his emotions at all. We know that from reading the Gospels. But there are times in the Gospels when we clearly see his emotions. Matthew 26, verse 38. Then Jesus said to them, that is Peter, James, and John, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Now, we don't know his emotional state at that point. We don't know if he was weeping, if he was crying, if he was, if he was crying out. But we look at these words, and these words are emotional words. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus was honest with his disciples about his struggle, was he not? Jesus knew what he was facing, and he shared it with those closest to him. How often do we need to take a risk and ask someone to share our sorrow and pain with us? Now, let me tell you what this does not mean, just on a practical level. This does not mean that you and I should tell everyone we run into our problems. That's what that does not mean. You ever known somebody that every time you saw them, they, they, they told you about every ache and pain they'd had forever and ever? You're smiling. I think some of you know those people. That's not what we're talking about here. Notice Jesus took his disciples and he, was, he, he bore his heart to them. We need to prayerfully ask the Lord, if, if you're going through a time of suffering or when you're going through a time of suffering, you need to prayerfully ask the Lord, if you don't have someone like this, to guide you to someone who will walk with you through your darkest days. The Christian faith has never been meant to be lived alone. That's what the church is about. So we can bear one another's burdens. Speaking of that, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. As Christians, we are commanded to help carry the burdens of one another. That word translated burden here refers to, to heavy loads that are difficult to carry. And probably every one of us at some point in our life has, has had a heavy load on us, and we, and we could not carry it alone, and and many of you, you reached out to other people, other believers in Christ, and you shared with them this heavy burden and just the sharing of it and just them praying with you and just them uh, showing compassion and concern for you and encouraging you. Didn't it seem to make that load just a little lighter? Just a little lighter. As it was used in, in, in Galatians, as this word burden was used in Galatians, it refers to a difficulty or trial that someone has trouble dealing with. Sometimes I think we let our pride get in the way in this issue. In this particular area, we let our pride get in the way. And we, we tend to think, well, if I, I'll, I'll just, I won't bother anybody. I'll just handle this by myself. And I'll just suffer in silence. There's nothing spiritual about that, my friends. There's nothing spiritual about that. We need one another, don't we? We need one another. <clears throat> Brings us to the third point, and that is Jesus did not suffer independent of the Father. He did not suffer independent from the Father. Far too often in the time of suffering, people, uh, even including many who claim to be Christians, uh, turn to everything but God in the time of suffering. 
Some people turn to alcohol and drugs, but all that does is put their suffering on hold and in reality adds to their suffering. Some he seek help through a secular counselor. That is, I say secular, that, that means one that does not point them to the Lord or to the Bible. <clears throat> Tries to solve their problem through the world's answers and the world's wisdom. Some turn to self-help books, but find that none of that truly helps them. Some try to ignore their problems and bury it deep in their heart, but that only makes it worse. And far too often we see prayer as what? We see it as the last resort when it should be the first thing we should do. Prayer should always be our, our, our default position. It should be the first thing we do every single time. <clears throat> prayer is the most vital thing we can do all the time. I've met so many prayer warriors in my years in ministry, and I'm always moved and inspired by these people. They, they see they're truly prayer warriors. I think the first one I ever met, I was a young man at the, at the ripe old age of 25 at our first church in Burlington, North Carolina. I was the minister of education and senior adults. Now let, let, that, let your mind wrap around that a little bit. 25 years old, minister to senior adults. Yeah, I learned, they learned nothing from me in those four years. I'm convinced I learned so much from those senior adults. But part of my job was to visit in the nursing homes and, and there was one lady and I can't remember her name, but I'll never forget her face. She was a prayer warrior. She was in a personal care home there in Burlington, North Carolina. And I, in my youthful arrogance, thought I, was, I had a list of everybody in our church that was uh, in a nursing home, personal care home, that kind of thing. And I would go visit them. And the church of that size had many of them. And so the week it came to go visit her, I asked one of the secretaries, I said, tell me about it. And when she said, she said to me, she's had crippling arthritis and has been bedridden for 10, 15 years at this point. So in my youthful ignorance, I'm thinking, what can I go to say and encourage this lady? She's got to be depressed. She's got to be down. I'm going... I am super minister. I'm going to encourage her kind of attitude, you know. I walk in her room in that personal care home and there laid in that bed an angel with a radiance about her and a smile on her face I'll never forget. And I introduced myself and she said this to me, I've been praying for you. And that's when my lesson on humility and prayer began with her. She was the most sweetest lady. And she had a prayer notebook, not a prayer journal. That thing was that thick. And she prayed through it every day. And instead of laying in that bed being angry and bitter, she prayed for people all day long. She said, what better thing can I do for my church family than to pray for them? And if she knew of a need in their life, she would pray for them. And the reason she said to me, I've been praying for you, even, she said, I knew my church was going to fill that staff position, and even before I knew your name, I was praying for you. To be quite honest, I went to see her more than any of the other homebound senior adults to get my encouragement to be ministered to. That's a prayer word. We've got some in this church. Richard Adams is a prayer warrior. That man is a prayer warrior. It's, it's just incredible. We, we need to just, he, he sees prayer, and this dear lady sees prayer as a first resort, and we need to, we need to be that way. Look at, listen to Psalm 50, verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Listen to James 5, 13. <clears throat> Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples in verse 40 and verse 46, pray that you may not enter into temptation. 
Now think about that for a moment. Jesus is facing the most excruciating experience any person before him had experienced or ever would. He's going to have, he's going to die an awful death on the cross. He's going to be crucified on the cross. And, <coughs> and besides that, he's going to be carrying the weight of every sin ever committed or would be committed. Think of that agony. And in that moment, he is having compassion and concern for his disciples that they not enter into temptation, that they not be tempted in such a way that they give in to it. And he encourages them to pray because he knew the trials that his disciples were about to face. And he told them to pray. And then in verse 42 of Luke chapter 22, look at what Jesus did. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. And then also in verse 42, look at what he prayed for. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. The cup was the suffering Jesus was about to endure on the cross for your sins and for my sins. But the cup was not just a physical suffering, as agonizing as that was going to be. As I've, as I've said, the cup was also the sin of all the world being placed on Jesus, the sinless one, the one who never sinned. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, <coughs> for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that we could become like him. <clears throat> now notice in this passage, Jesus received an immediate answer to his prayer. But God did not remove the cup. God the Father did not remove the cup of suffering from Jesus. But he did send, send an angel to strengthen him. Verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven to strengthen him. Rather than removing the cross from Jesus, the Father strengthened him for the cross. Rather than removing the suffering from Jesus, the Father strengthened him for the suffering. But Jesus was not finished praying just yet. Look at verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This word agony, it carries the, 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 the meaning of a great contest. He was battling within himself. And the struggle was so great that Jesus' sweat became like great drops of blood. Jesus used, I mean, Luke uses use of the word like suggests that the sweat fell to the ground like clots of blood. Or there is another possibility. There is this rare physical phenomenon in which under great emotional stress, the tiny blood vessels rupture in the sweat glands and produce a mixture of blood and sweat. Which was it? I don't know. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Let's not get so caught up in whether Jesus' sweat actually contained blood or not that we lose sight of the agony that our Lord was under. Also, do not lose sight of what Jesus' immediate action was when he was in agony, he prayed. He prayed. Not as a last resort, but as the first thing. I think Jesus is telling us here, if Jesus needed to pray in his time of struggle, how much more do you and I need to pray? Whatever's going on in our life, we need to pray. If we're on a mountaintop of joy and everything is great, we need to pray and thank God for it. If we're in the valley of suffering and agony, we need to pray and, and seek the strength and guidance of the Lord. Prayer should always be first. But 
The last point is this. Jesus did not suffer in disobedience to the Father. Disobedience. Verse 42. We read part of it a moment ago, but in verse 42, Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. We've looked at that, but look at what else he says. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had prayed that if there was any other way for mankind to be saved from their sins, that was his desire, but only if it was the Father's will. Jesus was fully God and he was fully human and he did not want to suffer what he was about to suffer, but more than anything, he wanted to please God, the Father. Jesus wanted and was willing to do the Father's will at all costs. He had suffered on this earth. But what he was about to experience was suffering like no one before or no one since has ever suffered. The suffering would be physical beyond description. It would be physical agony beyond description. But as I said earlier, the greater than that would be the spiritual agony of taking on himself all of the sins in the world. Jesus was sinless, but he became sin because that was the Father's will for paying for the penalty of sins. So it was settled. The cross was the Father's will, and Jesus would be obedient. The passage closes with these two verses, and when he rose from prayer, and it gives the, in, the you know, he's been in agony, he's been praying, he's been struggling, and, and the, the, this word here, when he rose from prayer, gives the indication that it was settled. Case closed. I'm going to the cross. He says he came to his disciples and found them sleeping in sorrow. Well, why would they be sleeping in sorrow? Jesus had been trying to prepare them for this. And just maybe they were starting to put some pieces together. And just maybe, maybe they realized that this wasn't going to be easy. And so they're sleeping in sorrow. And Jesus said to them, why are you sleeping? And here it is again, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Prayer. Prayer. So as we close this morning, What, does, what, do we, what do we learn from this? What do we learn from Jesus? I think we learn that when we suffer, and we will if we're not currently, we will suffer in one way or another. Remember that our Lord suffered. And when we suffer, let's depend on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's lean on them. Let's share our hearts with them. Share our burdens with them. And when we suffer, don't act like everything's all right. Express your thoughts. Shed tears. It's okay. And when you suffer, turn to God first in prayer and not last. And when you suffer, be obedient to the Lord, his will, his word, no matter what. 
knowing that God's will may lead us not away from suffering, but deeper into it. That last one's hard, isn't it? As I was preparing for this and thinking through that thought I, I, and thought about Jesus, I didn't have that last, that last couple of thoughts there on that last part of the closing until the Lord, I'm convinced the Lord said to me and so he pointed me to the scripture again. I had this overwhelming feeling I need to read the passage again. And it hit me. So often we think that obedience to the Lord's word, his will, him, his way, will lead us to an easier life, to a better life. And that's not true, is it? It wasn't true for Jesus. Well, ultimately it did. He reigns in heaven today over everything at the right hand of the Father. But in the immediate, Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father. And it did not lead him away from suffering. It led him deeper into it. And it may for you and I. But here's the good news. Suffering, agony, all of that stuff none of us want to deal with. It's contained to this earth and to hell. It's not allowed in heaven. It's not allowed in heaven. And it reminds me of a verse said by the Apostle Paul. These light and momentary troubles are not worthy of comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. Lord, we thank you for spending time in Gethsemane with, with Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and seeing his agony and seeing his suffering, and knowing that the agony and suffering would even get worse, even worse, even though he was following and being obedient to your will. Father, it reminds us sometimes while we're serving you and we can recount history after history of missionaries and faithful servants of yours who have remained faithful to you and it led them in a deep valley of suffering. But Father, if that's your will, that's the best place to be. Your will is always the best place to be. And if that includes suffering, then that's where we need to be. <clears throat> but Father, we thank you for the reminder also from your word that, that even the Apostle Paul could look at the suffering he endured and call it light and momentary troubles and remind us that what we experience on this earth, if, if we have surrendered to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, what we've experienced on this earth is not worthy of comparing to the glory that awaits us in heaven. Father, we praise you. If there's anyone today that needs to come and respond publicly, to kneel at this altar, to come for prayer, whatever their needs may be, Father, I pray they will, pray, they, they will, they will be obedient to you in these moments. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of decision is hymn 433, I Surrender All. If you need to respond publicly, won't you come?